Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 it says then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in every synagogue preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people you know that's what Jesus was doing we as a church we believe that one of the things that every person needs is they need the power of God in their life they need miracles there are problems we come in contact with that honestly human intellect colleges uh, college degrees our human connections our skills and our abilities are powerless but the power of God is what can solve those problems can somebody say amen, amen. somebody say we need power. power we need holy power holy spirit power power that heals the sick power that drives out demons power that stops nightmares cold power that delivers people from sexual addiction drug addiction but we need power that breaks generational cycles we need power that cures people mentally emotionally and physically we need power that sets people on the course of righteousness and power to live a godly life somebody say we need power and the Bible says Jesus went around all cities. See every city needs power of God. Every village needs the power of God. Whether it's in a western country or somewhere in India, Africa or Asia, everybody needs the power of God. And Jesus is not just somebody who teaches the gospel, He demonstrates the gospel. The Bible says He preached, He taught and He healed and diseases and sicknesses among people. But then in verse 36 it says the following, and when He saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. So in the verse 35, the Bible says he heals the sick. He the casts out demons. He moves powerfully in power. And we as the church, we, we recognize that church has to be a place of power. One of the things that we have a vision for is that within a few months, it might happen in a few weeks, but that's our dream this year is to open a third. When we come to the point of opening the third service on Sunday night, to open a power service where the prayer line for deliverance, where the healings will be taking place and where a lot of the things that we sometimes don't have time in the morning services to happen in the evening service because people need power. And we need to be a church and you have to make room for power. You have to make space. You can't just kind of expect the power to come. There has to be a room that we make for God. And so begin to pray for those services. It will happen on Sunday night. It will be power service. It will be Holy Ghost power service. Amen. It doesn't mean that our Sunday morning services, it doesn't mean that our Sunday morning services, they have to lack power. But because of the structure and because of the things that we have, we realize that we need to have a special service where it will be a power service. Because people don't just need power. People also need pasture. Somebody say pasture so people don't just need miracles they also need the message and the bible in here it says that jesus looked at people it says that he wasn't just teaching people he wasn't just healing people but he was also preaching the gospel and teaching so he was healing but he was preaching preaching is when you scream and teaching when you when you're quiet and so we need to have both can somebody say amen we need to have when you preach scream in other words and then when you when you talk normal and so when you come in and it's too loud it's because it's preaching when you come in and it's like too many points it's because it's teaching okay so Jesus was screaming and then he was also had three point sermons and then he was also healing so people don't just need power people also need pasture somebody say pasture pasture meaning they need preaching something that fires you up and they need teaching something that feeds you so preaching fires you up but the teaching feeds you. We need both. We need teaching and we need preaching. Now some of you, you only like preaching. You only like if somebody's screaming and yelling at you. Because you used to, maybe you grew up in an abusive home where the only time you heard something is when it was screamed at you. And so that's why you like preachers, you know. And then some of you, you know, you grew up in a, in a functional good home where people were speaking to you. So you don't like to come to church. You're like, why is he screaming? What is wrong with him? And so because you like more of a teaching. That's why all the people you listen to during the week, all the people you read are more teachers. And that is good. But we need preaching, teaching and healing. Because people need power and people need pasture. We need miracles but we also need message. Somebody say amen. But I want you to see what Jesus says in here. But when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion for them. For they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. These people already had power and they already had pasture. But they had no pastors. They already had miracles and they had a message. They had no mentors. And the Bible says he looked at this crowd who were being healed, who were being screamed at and who were being taught with three-point sermons. 
and he looked at them and I want you to see he didn't look at them with joy he didn't look at them with a sense of accomplishment I did it great I preached a great sermon people loved it uh, people were healed awesome testimonies were collected awesome the Bible says he looked at the multitudes with compassion he felt bad and he says because they were watch this they were not goats they were not pigs they were not dogs they were sheep meaning these were the people who already believed in him these were the people who already had pasture and they already had miracles they had power experience and Jesus looked at them and he says there's something else they all need he says and because they don't have that need met they are sheep without a shepherd how could Jesus the shepherd say that when he's the shepherd you will say well that doesn't that contradicts Jesus says I am the great shepherd because see he wasn't their personal shepherd you can't be a personal shepherd to 5,000 people come on you can't father 5,000 children you can maybe lead a 5,000 employee company but you can't mentor 5,000 people you can't do that up close and Jesus knew that I physically cannot shepherd all these people that's why he says they're they're fed they're being ministered to but they are weary and scattered he doesn't say they are sick and bankrupt spiritually meaning they got the food they got the miracles but they are lacking direction and they are lacking personal inspiration to live their life on point and on purpose and because of that they don't have shepherds and then Jesus says that harvest is plentiful so he switches the whole thing he says not only my kingdom lacks these mentors and these shepherd like people but he says when I raise more shepherds and more laborers more leaders he said not only they'll help the sheep they'll also reach the harvest that has not even reached yet so people need power people need pasture and people need pastors now you may say well I go to a church I have a pastor I'm not talking about that I'm talking about somebody who knows you I'm talking about somebody you know somebody who notices when you don't come to church somebody who invites you to a cell group somebody who knows what's happening with your life you're like well that's what I have Vlad for well the problem is the moment it reaches more than 20 people Vlad can do that and our church is more than that and so even Jesus couldn't do that because he wouldn't have compassion on them if shepherding meant you can reach 5,000 men with one microphone and one sermon Jesus looked at them and says I can heal I can preach and I can teach but he says I cannot mentor because it requires personal and we can't get personal with 5,000 people and therefore they are weary and they are scattered maybe your Christian life looks like that you're like man I, I got the word I come to church but I feel weary I feel like I don't have a sense of direction in my life because see you need not only miracles you need not only message you also need mentors in your life and so that one day you can be a mentor to someone else you need to you need to be ministered to you say no I'm fine no yeah you're not sick yeah you're not hungry but are you weary and scattered is your life all over the place does your life has a sense of direction of why you exist as a Christian and that's one of the reasons we have this process of discipleship where you go from believe to belong from belong to build and from built to become become what not famous not known but become who God wants you to become the fisher of souls the winner of souls and maker of disciples God wants us to take that process our goal in church is not to make church of members or church even of volunteers is to be a church of disciples and eventually church of laborers in his harvest field that's why Jesus simply said here he says pray to the Lord of the harvest and I want you to notice what he did not ask us to pray for he didn't say pray for more leaders he says pray for more laborers because we have leaders we need laborers laborers in what laborers of love because Bible keeps saying this one word all throughout the scripture we see the in Hebrews 6 10 and 1st Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1st 1 13 it says to be laborers in love because you can have a title of leader but what we really need what the church really needs is people who labor and love who intent intentionally and purposely give their life for someone else reach out to someone else it helps somebody grow grow in Christ create an environment in their home where other people come in because you can slap a labor label of a leader and anyone but to have a heart of a laborer a laborer of love my friend that takes the work of the Holy Spirit because love is labor 
Love is not a feeling. It's work. And for those of you who are married, say amen. When you were dating, you know, you thought love is just simply fuzzy, fuzzy feelings. Well, that wasn't love. That was infatuation. Real love is when you roll up your sleeves. It's buying flowers. It's saying nice things. It's apologizing. It's pick, taking out the garbage. It's biting your tongue when you want to spill your beans. It's, it's, it's labor. That's why love is labor. Amen. Amen. When our church started in the beginning, our church was started by our pastor, Pastor Vasily, with a vision to reach to the lost people. Our pastor, he was a missionary in Russia for many years where he started churches and when he came to the United States, um, people did not tell him or he didn't believe in the fact that the mission of Jesus needs to be reached even in the United States by people like us. For most of the people of my background who come to the United States, their first you know thing is to preserve their faith and keep their children and their family from being contaminated by American culture. And my pastor had a completely reverse theology. <laughs> <laughs> he thought the only way you preserve them is if you send them into it and from the beginning he he was training us to to go into schools I remember my Russian friends would go to schools to get degrees we went to school to get people <laughs> we were like recruitment agency spreading flyers I, I didn't even think about my classes like for reals I only was thinking about where can I post the flyers about the services Classes were like, oh, that was just, oh yeah, that's right. We have to do the homework. And, and the interesting part is that I had A's. The people who went there for grades barely could make up a C. And so, and we were from the beginning trained almost like these, like these agents of the kingdom. You, you don't go to school. You use the school to get the mission of God in it. You're there, you're, you're there to hijack the culture. You're there to bring the message of God. It worked. Now we didn't reach a lot of people, at least we didn't get contaminated by the world. And so parents, I just want to encourage you, don't set the bar too low for your children. Don't, don't pray for your children and say, Lord, just keep them away from sin. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, I'm sending them into the world. Begin to have a vision that is higher and God will keep your kids away from sin as a bonus. The world should be praying, oh God, Keep our children away from these Christians. <laughs> Atheists should be praying. Oh, oh, that's right. There's no God. And so whoever is there, keep our children away from Christians. Why? Because they got a youth group. Because they got an amazing program. They can invite my kids and they're going to get them saved and sanctified and freed for the glory of God. Come on, somebody. Pastor Lad, you're shoving religion down somebody's throat. No, bringing life. If people can sell dope, we sell hope. We bring the gospel of Jesus Christ and we have a mission. And so while we were mission minded, I really believe you're either a missionary or a mission field. If you're not winning the lost, you're lost. Spiritually, you're lost. It might be you're serving God, but you're weary and scattered. And so our pastor from the beginning, barely, I barely spoke any English. This is why we exist. We're going to bring the lost. We're going to go into the streets. We're going to evangelize. We've done a lot of radical crazy stuff. Um, the protesters, you know, the stand with signs. 16 years ago, that was us. Oh yeah, big signs. We were not protesting, but we, were, we had signs. Huge signs, humongous signs. I remember standing on one side and Ilya was standing on the other side. Humongous sign that was talking about, you know, prayer for Tri-Cities, revival for Tri-Cities. You know, it wasn't raining when Noah was building the ark. Like very dislike, like these life-threatening quotes and uh, car washes for one simple reason, not to raise money so that we can give a flyer to invite people to church. And we did a lot of invitation, but not a lot of people came to church. It was very discouraging and very disappointing. Um, the culture of our church at that time, we did not know how to do it better. And somehow when few people would come, they would leave. It was very difficult for people to come and stay in our church when everything was in the Russian language with translation. And the translation that we did, it was still with the Russian flavor. <laughs> everything, we pretty much brought a Russian church in America hoping to convert people both to Christianity and Russianity. Rus <laughs> Russianity. It was difficult. It was very, very difficult. With time we started to learn. We've grown. We've changed so much. Bryson and Brittany remembers that. From, we've changed so much. The church you see today, 
some of you would have never came second time 20 years ago never you would have left a really bad review praise God that there was no reviews on Facebook and Google at the time for the churches it was very difficult we started to change slowly the changes we've applied for example one of those things is today you see an English service that wasn't the case 20 years ago today you see you know people coming to church and coming second time I remember when we saw people coming for three times in a row how big of a deal it was for us that somebody who did not speak Russian would come back again and again the biggest breakthrough for us at that point was when somebody got saved and got water baptized and they were not Russian you guys have no idea how big deal that was and then when they went through the membership classes and they became a life group leader for us it was like a pride thing it was like we were showing off our poster boy right here Br Brittany Bryson like white people are in our church please forgive me for the racial remark that's how we saw it like American people are actually like joining our church it's like a validation from heaven we're real we're gonna make it in this culture it was not easy it was very very difficult we fought because of a cultural difference the way people perceive us being a minority in this country having an accent not understanding the culture really well it wasn't easy but we fought we we, we said we're gonna change whatever we need to change within us how we present ourselves how we project ourselves for one simple purpose we want to reach our community for Christ we are not in Africa we are not in Russia we are not in Asia we are in the United States this is our community we have to change so that we can bring change I remember when a huge breakthrough that happened when you know when we started to have not only our leaders who were Spanish or Hispanic American or other cultures but when we had the staff and we had people on our staff who were not just Russian it was such a big breakthrough for some of you guys you see this as normal I want to tell you something for us it was a price for us it, it wasn't normal we dreamed of that today more than half of our staff is not Slavic people no more we no longer speak in Russian there we have codes you know where we say something <laughs> behind somebody's back we did that though in the beginning <laughs> I remember pastor came one time and asked Bryson to leave so he can speak to us in Russian so we don't have to translate Bryson we explain later <laughs> that has changed today we have a board of trustees and most of them are not Russian people today people within our church are married within Russian and Hispanic and American and other different cultures are marrying within each other. I want to tell you something. It took a very long time to get to this point, but it was intentional. None of it happened by accident. Every church culture is either built by default or by design. Every pastor has a vision, but you must understand vision is eaten by culture. Culture eats vision for breakfast. Culture of the church destroys the vision you can have a vision for miracles but if the culture of the church is not built for that that's why when we have a vision the next thing we had to do for a long time and that's exactly what I'm doing with this sermon right now is reinforcing the culture because in culture miracles happen naturally in culture people get brought to Christ naturally that's why in Jamaica they grow bananas but you cannot do that in Alaska why because of the climate you can preach a sermon in Alaska, bananas won't grow because there's no climate, there is no culture and before there was just no culture in the church where new people were welcomed, where new people were attended to, when they had a process to go through and they felt like part of the church and we had to build it with our sermons, we had to build it with our personal examples, we had to build it by cutting sacrifices and removing certain things and even asking certain people not to stand in front of that door because they look like holy scanners. ripped jeans what is that <laughs> culture is very important one of the things that we started to do first on our youth service and I'm just giving you a little background of where we at as I'm leading it to into this message we started first on Wednesday nights this was our youth night at the time as we made a decision that I used two stories from the Bible to drive this one big point to create a place where people can belong even if they don't believe and I use the story of Lot and Sodom when Lot saw first-time guests approaching the parking lot of Sodom he quickly ran to them 
he took their name he took their number invited them to the house he washed their feet offered them something to eat he treated them like VIPs little did he know they were angels Sodom when they saw the first time guests they wanted to violate them abuse them and this is what I taught to our team in the beginning in the youth ministry I said there's two ways we treat first time guests we attract them or we attack them we're either Sodom or we Lot there's no middle ground and I know the church will say well we're not attacking new people I remember one pastor told me he says well I'm not against them coming the doors are open we don't lock our doors the way we attack new people in church is by indifference and judgmental attitude how did the older son attack the younger son by not wanting to come into the house he was in the father was invitational the older son was indifferent and we started to teach our team the way you attack people is not by going physically attacking them it's by ignoring them when somebody walks into the church for the first time if you ignore them you're attacking them why because they already feel pressure not knowing anybody and you just added to that pressure by pretty, pretty much passing them by and talking all to your friends and to your family members when I get invited to your house and I knock on the door you don't scream from the inside your laundry room hey it's open I'm your guest you're gonna quickly run to the front door and you're gonna open and you're not gonna say yeah make yourself at home uh, there's a couch with a remote control if you want a burger it's, it's, in, the, it's in, the, in the fridge why I'm just watching a Netflix show in my room right now nobody would do that because if a first time guest come to your house you will stop what you're doing even if it's a cost to you and you're gonna take that person put them on the couch you're gonna spend time with them and you're gonna walk them out of the house and when they walk out of the house you're gonna breathe a sigh of relief <laughs> and now you go about your normal business and this is what we started to teach our church our youth ministry and the reason why I'm sharing this is because this needs to be retaught again to our whole church if you call this church your church one time to your friends this is your house every person that walks into that door whom you have not seen is your guest it's insulting to have people come to your house and treat them indifferently we don't have visitors in our church we only have guests and these guests are the true VIPs and my friend if this is your house the person sitting behind you, the person sitting in front of you and three people sitting beside you are the people you have to be a lot to. Invite them over to your life group. Ask them their name. Find out how they heard about the church. You have to be like the, the father to the prodigal son. When he saw the son from afar in that culture, older men did not run like that. The Bible says he forgot about the culture. He ran to the parking lot because the son was in the parking lot. He ran to the parking lot. That's why I said parking lot ministry is the most important ministry in the church. Yeah. He did not wait in his office and say, I will see when the sun will come in. I will see if he comes to the altar. I will see if he goes through the altar call room. I will see if he comes next week. I'm going to monitor his progress. The father ran to the parking lot, hugged him, kissed him. Now, we wouldn't have to do the, the, the kissing part. You can high five somebody. You can stretch your hand and ask them for their name. You don't have to do the kissing part, but you, you can show affection and show interest. And that son you know started to repent it was he was broken and the older son stood on the side and he was he was watching i'm going to tell you one thing one of the reasons why many people don't get saved is because when people do come to church many of us hinder them from coming to get saved because we don't show invitational welcoming attitude we don't take responsibility some of us don't evangelize at all at least in the church make those that somebody else evangelizes welcome I'm gonna speak straight and this is a family talk for those of you for the first time this is the talk you will get if you come back <laughs> but today this is not for you this is for, for your neighbor I want to challenge us why because the culture of the church is built by what we value and what we teach and what we model we've opened the VIP room where we you know give extra attention to the first time guests one of the reasons why is because we don't want to be a Sodom we want to be Lot. The strangers will become angels. The people who come for the first time as strangers, they become brother. When Lewis came for the first time and stood there and got saved, he was a stranger. Today, 
he's a relative why because anytime you treat strangers as VIP they will be angels they will become your close friends one day they could become pillars and leaders of this church and I want to give each person right now a responsibility if this is your home church if you became a member and you're coming here today I want to challenge you this is your responsibility to help us create a place where people belong even if they don't believe let's be a place like father like older father like the, the like the father to the youngest son when we come in we embrace people we welcome people that's why we got a golf cart where it's not out yet in a few weeks it's going to be out that's why we bought the little signs and that's why we offer all of those things people say why so much this is not about a show for us this is about one thing is we really want people who are far from Christ to feel a little dose of God's love before they even hear the message that even if they trip over our service that they will be captured by our love they might not get healed but they will have to be loved we're gonna make it impossible for them not to be loved and one of the biggest hindrances to us loving people is us feeling like I didn't do anything wrong that's not your standard indifference is bad we're called to show attention to be invitational not just to settle with the fact I didn't look give anybody a dead, a, a dead look I didn't give anybody a stare I didn't you know condemn anybody I didn't walk away from somebody I didn't go like this no 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 no, no my friend in the kingdom that's not what that's not your success story your success story is to meet is to invite and to bring somebody in because somebody say amen and the reason why I'm sharing this today is because we need to keep on as the church gets bigger we need to keep on this culture of invitation in our church people are not looking for a friendly church we used to think when we were building our youth ministry one of the things that we had to teach our young leaders is this is people are not looking for a friendly youth group they are looking for friends in the youth group one of the biggest problems that we can have as Christians is this is when you meet 10 people but you never really meet met anyone so we tell our people and I'm going to share with you our people today don't meet 10 people meet one person for 10 minutes don't meet many meet one let's not become a friendly church people are sick of those churches because everybody's hi bye hey how you doing you know like you go in the, in the trail hey how are you I, I, once I wanted to stop and tell them everything that's going on you know what I'm not doing good right now <laughs> my life is actually really really difficult but see people are being polite and I understand that I respect that people when they come to church they're not just looking for a friendly church they're looking for a friend Let's be those friends by simply taking time to be with one person instead of saying hi to every single person meet every person's name and the moment they walked away we're like what was his name again i know you can't do that to everyone but it should never stop us from doing that to someone can somebody say amen in the conclusion i want to share with you just two thoughts the second stage of spiritual growth is belonging that belonging includes life class life group and freedom weekend life class is where we really feel like you can belong you can build relationships where you can take your next step with God life class which is going to happen during the second service is kind of like our, our assimilation into the vision of the church into the church life we don't like to call it membership we like to call it like partnership or being a part of but it's still also a part where you can become a member where you can find a place to serve where you can um, then go to freedom weekend you may say what is freedom weekend it's from nine to about three we do it about twice to three times a year where we take people through inner healing we take people through um, for baptism of the Holy Spirit it's really like a spiritual a very deep spiritual retreat we don't offer that to the public we only offer that to people who are in the church the reason why is because people who receive that deep freedom if they are not anchored in the church it will do them no good actually it'll work against them so we want people who go through that to after that go into destiny training so they can be discipled and to be people who are going to make a difference for God. With that said, the two, thought, the two thoughts I want to share in the conclusion is the first one. Some people will never believe until they belong. One of the reasons we are building a culture and I'm preaching about this right now and I know this is not a financial message or maybe a seem like a spiritual message. But one of the reasons we are creating a culture of belonging in our church is that some people will never believe unless they belong in fact Jesus Christ did not invite his disciples to believe in him he invited them to belong first you don't see Jesus coming to disciples and says come and believe in me he says come and meaning come and be with me for first few years 
they didn't even believe because when he rose from the dead he convicted them and rebuked them for lack of their belief and so Jesus didn't seek to make people believe in him he first made room for them to belong before they believed and I believe this is the principle that works in the church a lot of people are not gonna believe until they first belong so we have to allow them to belong instead of saying well unless you believe I don't want to know your name there is a verse in John chapter 11 verse 39 it says the following Jesus said take away the stone Martha the sister of him who's been dead said to him Lord by this time there is a stench for he has been dead four days Lazarus is dead Martha and Mary is saying Jesus can you do a miracle can you um, do something when he was sick Jesus comes late he's buried already four days he stinks and Jesus comes and I want you to see this Jesus does not raise Lazarus until he asks people who love Lazarus to remove a stone I believe when people come there are stones they have against God there are stones they have against Christians and a lot of people before they trust in God they'll test you they'll see how you'll treat them let's see how you will talk will you come in and genuinely care for them and I believe that God a lot of times waits before he sends his word Lazarus before he told Lazarus he told people remove the stone so I want to ask us today at church remove indifference to every person who you don't know in church remove the thing well I'm not a social person you just I it's just, I'm just I like to stay to myself Jesus is saying I'm about to do resurrection I'm about to bring revival of salvation to church I'm about to do miracles signs and wonders so like yeah I want that sign me up Lord and he says uh there's a role you have to play it's a very simple role you don't have to do the lifting of the resurrection I just want you to move the stone but Lord those people there is a stench but Lord I don't know them Lord but they're different skin but they're different age but God they they got they got tattoos they got earrings in places people shouldn't put earrings in Lord but they smoked I saw in the parking lot he threw away a cigarette Lord but there is a smell of alcohol out of their mouth but Lord I know them they were divorced and Jesus says do you want a resurrection yeah remove the stone remove indifference give people a place to belong you may say does that mean we approve of their sin listen no, 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 it has nothing to do with that it's about showing love it's about showing kindness and helping people to belong before they believe Jesus did not raise Lazarus from the dead until people did a little bit of work and that's what we taught in our youth ministries guys God is gonna save people but we are gonna have a little work to do and that is this when worship is done at the end of the service we don't go to our instruments but we go to new people when pastors we don't hide in green rooms but we go to people why because we are called to remove the stone so that God can raise the dead amen the second point the last point is even if they don't need to belong so they can believe they do need to belong so they can become some people will never become if they don't belong Lazarus gets raised from the dead and then Jesus sends people to him again this, this time is different he says remove the grave clothes and I believe when people get saved they need people around them to know their name to know their number to know what's going on with them why because there's a lot of ropes of fear rejection shame every person has that that, that those people Jesus raised them from the dead but Jesus did not remove the ropes and a lot of times we feel like well you know the preacher is the one that's preaching he needs to be the one to go and removes everybody's ropes people don't need the preacher people need you and I yeah, I preach here but when I step down from there I'm normal Christians just like everyone else and God will use me God will use you to remove a robe of loneliness to remove a robe of rejection to remove a robe of condemnation shame guilt God will use you to remove the rope he will raise them but he will use you to remove the rope from them because they cannot become unless they belong can somebody say amen you know Jesus Christ was the son of God yet he needed earthly parents to help him to grow up Jesus Christ had a calling on his life to save the world yet he needed normal not super hyper ultra spiritual parents Joseph was not a priest and Mary was not a prophetess they were average Joe of that day they were not super spiritual but they were good people 
And guess who God put His Son in? Now, God did not need Joseph so that Jesus can be born, but He needed Joseph so Jesus can grow. If Jesus needed mom and dad who were earthly parents, my friend, every man and a woman who gets saved in our church needs somebody around them. And you might not be able to speak in tongues a lot or do this and that, but can you love, can you care, and can you connect? And if you can do that, God will use you to help them become. Woo! Can somebody say amen? Last thing I want to share and we're going to pray. Isaac and Ishmael in the Bible had the same father but Isaac and Ishmael had a different destiny even though they had the same father. The reason they had two different destinies is because they had a different mother. Every Christian has the same father but every Christian has a different destiny. Some Christians never fulfill their calling in life because every Christian though having the same father they don't have the same mother. They don't have the same nurture. They don't have the same care. Some Christians get saved by a father but they are discipled by culture. They are discipled still by their old friends and therefore they no longer become Isaac. They live like Ishmael even though God is their father. And there are some who get saved here and they have God as their father. But they have allowed Sarah, they have allowed the new covenant, they have allowed the life groups, they have allowed mentors and believers to come around them and to raise them. Please understand my friend, we don't need to help them to belong so they can be saved. But if we want them to become Isaac instead of Ishmael, God will need a Sarah. God will do the miracle of birthing but we're gonna have to do the process of becoming and belonging, creating that family culture in their life. Why? Because everything that's born out of Abraham can be destined to be an Isaac unless they have a different mother. And Ishmael attacked Isaac. Ishmael went and did crazy stuff. Isaac was blessed by God. One of the reasons we want to create a place of belonging, one of the reasons we push cell groups so hard is because we want people who get saved not to be Ishmael's but to be Isaac's. We want people to be like Jesus who had a great calling, a fully God and fully man but Mary and Joseph helped. They, they were not Moses and Joshua but they protected Jesus, they gave him his name and they helped him to grow until about 30 years of age and then he went on on his own. God can use you to be a Mary and a Joseph to somebody's life. Some of you, you will disciple people who will change the world. Some of you will have people in your cell group who will go and plant churches and start that. But I want to tell you something. We are called here to build a culture where people belong before they believe. And even if they don't need to belong, they come and they're like, you know what, I'm good. My daddy never hurt me. My daddy was always there. I don't need nobody to shake their hand to me and talk to me so I can feel belong. I belong in this church no matter what. But they still need to feel like they belong so they can become. Isaac so they can become disciple makers so they can become a father and a mother to somebody else. Can somebody say amen? That's our culture and the reason I'm talking about that today is because I want to reinforce this culture. I want each one of us to take a part of that. This is not Vlad's church, this is your church. This is our church. Let's make this a place where it's not just friendly but where people can find friends. Let's make this a place where there's no indifference but there's a sense of invitation. We don't attack new people, we attract new people. Let's make it a place where you can belong before you believe. Let's make this, this, this a place once you believe you're gonna have to belong. Why? Because God has a purpose for you so you can become a disciple maker. Let's make this a place where we help people to take the next step in God. In Jesus name. I want us to rise to our feet. Before we pray for healing, I want to give an invitation to anybody that's watching us on live stream or anyone in this room. For people who maybe don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. I would like to give you an invitation today. To surrender your life to the Lord. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're in this room and you have not given your life to the Lord, you haven't surrendered your heart to Jesus. Maybe you walked away from God or perhaps you've never had a relationship with the Lord. Maybe your friend invited you today and you listened to the service and something inside of you resonated. There's a conviction of the Holy Spirit that you need to get right with God. You need to surrender your life to the Lord. Perhaps your life is a mess or maybe your heart is just so empty and void because there is no peace, there is no forgiveness. The Bible says it is appointed for a man to die and then there's a judgment. We will stand before the Lord and we will give an account for our life. 
none of our good works will ever be enough to earn salvation my friend no matter how many times you go to church you did your confessions and you prayed your rosemary's none of that will get you saved only Jesus gets you saved if you would like to give your life to Jesus today and you're saying I would like to commit my life to God I would like to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior I would like to be born again I would like to repent of my sins today I would like to start a new life with God when I count to three I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand as high as you can and I would like to pray with you if you're watching us on live stream you can comment below I would like to get saved and our moderators will stay right now with you and pray for you one two three raise your hand high if you're saying I would like to get saved today I would like to give my life to the Lord today raise it hand high and I'm gonna pray with you and I'm praying that Jesus will come into your heart forgive you of your sin pray this prayer with me say Lord Jesus I am a sinner please forgive me of all my sin and wash me with your precious blood I come the way I am but I believe that you will give me a new heart and you will transform me from the inside out in Jesus name if you pray that prayer and it's first time go to hungrygen.com slash vip fill it out so that we can know so we can follow up on you and stay in touch with you